The social contract between the humanities and our publics is broken, and we don't know what to do about it. We routinely see articles warning students not to major in the arts, humanities, or social sciences. For example, here is Peter Cohen in Forbes. For students, lenders, and parents, it makes no sense to send a child to college to study humanities if they don't have a chance at getting a job that uses the skills they've developed. And he goes on to say, one thing is clear, academia's efforts to preserve its special exemption from the laws of economics is becoming too burdensome for many students, parents, and lenders to bear. The uselessness of the humanities is often demonstrated by statistics. You know, see, here, here are the statistics. People are voting with their feet. And this is a sort of one of a, a common type of graph that you see. Uh, I realize that some of the years are hard to see, but this is a sort of, you see a sort of rise up until about 1969, late 60s, early 70s, into the 80s, a precipitous drop, and then things sort of bubble along like that. And these are the uh, major disciplines in the humanities, English, history, these are of course the humanities in North America, not, uh, not elsewhere, English, history, uh, languages, and my home discipline, philosophy. Um, as you can see, there's a, a precipitous drop starting in the late 90s and 70s after a boom in the 50s and 60s. And usually when people are using these statistics to show why you shouldn't study the humanities, they cut the graph off here uh, and, uh, and sort of show why uh, you know, nothing much has happened. In fact, if you look at this graph more carefully, a couple of things stand out. The first is, of course, the extraordinary boom after the war in the 50s and 60s in the humanities. And uh, I don't think we fully understand why that happened. Um, and nor do we understand why there was this sort of turn. But the other thing that a lot of people have pointed out is that in fact, since the, sort of the mid 80s, it's actually been sort of flat. And if you separate out gender, you discover that a lot of the drop has in fact been a drop in women in the humanities. And that's not so much an issue of the humanities as the fact that a lot of the other disciplines become far more welcoming and inclusive. This is a good thing in some ways, that women were not being sidelined into the humanities, but were beginning to participate a lot more in medicine and the sciences. Nonetheless, these statistics uh, do indicate to some extent that the situation for the humanities is perilous, especially in state-funded universities. There are all sorts of reasons given for the lack of public engagement in the humanities, this breaking of the social contract. In fact, it's become a little bit of a cottage industry, and you can find people routinely defending the humanities with various arguments, and you can probably recite them all. That said, there's one trend in particular for this crowd that I think we need to be consider that we need to consider. I'm not going to go into the various arguments, but there's one trend that we need to consider, and that is the argument of disruption. Pundits like Clay Shirky, when they're talking about MOOCs especially, have commented how the universities are, are about to suffer something very equivalent to what the music industry and newspaper industry have suffered. In the music industry, technologies like Napster and then eventually iTunes allowed people to not have to buy an entire al album, unbundling the, the album and allowing people to pick and choose what they wanted. So there was, no longer, there was no longer a sort of industry structure that forced you to buy the, into the whole thing. Likewise, newspapers have suffered dramatically because, again, people can pick and choose the news they want. You don't have to buy the big 10-pound New York Times with the sports sections and all the sections they'd never read. And for that matter, you can get your, you can get your classified ads directly from Craigslist or some other uh, location online. And this has had a, a, a dramatic effect on the economic model for newspapers. And the argument is, is that MOOCs and online forms of education are going to have the same effect on universities. They're going to disrupt the higher education sector and force us to unbundle all the various things that we have gathered under the name of the universities. We can see universities, like newspapers, as being built around this aggregated product where users uh, where the cost of the university um, 
where woven into the cost of a university education, whether it is paid for by an individual or the state, are all sorts of functions that those individuals, their parents and lenders don't really want to pay for, like research or climbing walls. This, by the way, is our brand new climbing wall at the University of Alberta. It is so cold, so long, that you know, we have to resort, and of course we're on the prairies, so there's nothing resembling a mountain for 100 kilometers. So we've built our own little artificial one uh, there. The, the, the uh, projection isn't quite the best, but uh, you can sort of see it. This is the type of thing that in North America, a lot of people, a lot of students expect as part of the bundled package of the university. But MOOCs and other forms of online learning are disaggregating those things. <coughs> And it gets worse. If Shirky is right, the very idea of a university that brings together a community of learning and unites disciplines may get disrupted. Some would argue that the useless disciplines like classics, philosophy, have survived because they've been protected by the traditions of the university as a whole, the traditions of what a university should be. While the humanities might be starved, no one was willing to actually cut them let me figure out how to scroll here. Nobody was willing to actually cut them because then you would have to ask whether or not your institution could call itself a university at all. Now, unfortunately, especially with the sort of long-term, slow budget cuts that we're seeing in North America, many administrators feel they have no choice and we're beginning to see the, whole, the closing of entire departments, especially languages and unfortunately, especially European languages as students vote with their feet. We face a situation where the humanities may get balkanized into summer programs and uh, find itself only really supported in the private universities where it doesn't really matter what degree you get. If you go to Harvard, it doesn't really matter what, whether or not you do classics or business because you're probably gonna get a job because you went to Harvard. I'm still adapting to this computer. Let's see if I can find my pointer. Uh, there we go. Which brings me to the question that I want to address today. How can we organize the pursuit of knowledge so that it re-engages the publics? In particular, how can we use the very network technologies that threaten to disaggregate the university to strengthen it and to strengthen the research functions which many people, many of the taxpayers, which is a phrase we like to use in North America, I'm not sure if it's used as much here, but uh, uh, to, to, to strengthen the university and the research function for those taxpayers. I prefer this question or set of questions to trying to defend the humanities and I'd, I'd argue that is actually a more authentic question and a more interesting question. Ultimately, we should not be trying to defend the humanities simply because they're there. We should be trying to defend interesting forms of thinking and their traditions. So you can imagine, given this conference, what the solutions are that I'm going to bring you. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about changing research practice, and then I'm going to spend most of my time talking about citizen research. Um, and specifically crowdsourcing, if I have time, I'll mention something about crowdfunding. And I'll be showing a couple examples uh, from both the University of Alberta and elsewhere. So the first thing I want to do is talk about uh, changes in research culture. And in particular, I want to sort of give you an image of how research practices are thought about in the humanities. That image, and uh, I'm using this sort of Rembrandt here because I think it sort of captures uh, that, uh, the, the image, the, in particular, the Cartesian image of research as solitary practice. We've inherited this image from Descartes and specifically from his discourse on method. And I want to read you a little bit of his discourse on method because I think it is a story that we have absorbed without always questioning it. As I was returning to the army from the coronation of the emperor, I was halted by the onset of winter in quarters where, having no diverting company and fortunately also no cares or emotional turmoil to trouble me, I spent the whole day shut up in a small room heated by a stove in which I could converse with my own thoughts at leisure. 
Among, these, among the first of these was the realization that things made up of different elements and produced by the hands of several master craftsmen are often less perfect than those on which one person has worked. This story, if those of you who have uh, you know, paid attention to the, to, to the discourse and method, you'll know that in some ways he tells the story of doubt, and that leads to the method. But the irony is, of course, that readers typically sort of absorb the story without actually paying attention to the method or actually doubting Descartes himself. But nonetheless, it's a really compelling story, and this story had a real impact uh, on the reading public of his time, because all of a sudden he was saying, look, you too can be a philosoph. You just have to start by that radical doubt, that radical questioning, that freeing yourself of anything that anybody else has thought and boiling it down until you get to the cogito, I think therefore I am. And then like me, you can rebuild your whole sort of empire of thought and you're probably gonna not bother to actually think about it too much, so you're gonna end up rebuilding it the way I did. Of course in the humanities, there are other traditions of research practices or other images of research practices. Uh, an old one that I'm particularly fond of, and I think I, I wrote my PhD thesis on, is, is dialogue. And what we see here is David's uh, interpretation of the death of Socrates. You'll remember that Socrates was actually sentenced to death by his peers, by the citizens of Athens, for corrupting the youth. And how did he corrupt the youth? He corrupted them by entering into dialogue with important people in public spaces. It, he, he was, in effect, the, the really nasty questioner who won't shut up at a conference like this, who, who picks on a sort of pompous guy like me and begins to ask the embarrassing questions and shows that I actually know nothing in front of all of you, and all of you youth then decide, oh, well, I don't need a university education. Um, what's interesting about this painting, among other things, is we have Plato at the end here with a scroll there, so we, in some sense, have, we have the, uh, between Socrates, we have the, uh, the end of prophetic philosophy and oral philosophy, and with the beginning of a sort of written philosophy, publish or perish. We have Xanthippe, Socrates' wife, leaving there. And those of you who know the Socratic sort of uh, uh, dialogues know that uh, Xanthippe is actually exiled, uh, is sent away. And that says a certain amount about uh, Greek philosophy at the time. And for that matter, things that are still true about research practices in, in philosophy uh, today. My point, however, is, is that we have, we have these two competing images of what it is to do research in the humanities, especially in philosophy. And these, are, and these competing ideas struggle around the notion of the engagement with the public. Who is the public? How do you engage with them? And to some extent, especially in publish or perish culture, the dominant idea is the idea of solitary work. And it's built around an idea of the epistemic value of writing. The real research in the humanities happens when you write. And you can only write alone. And if you ever have multiple authors, then what happened is that somebody wrote some parts and somebody wrote the other parts, but the thinking happened uh, alone. And that idea still uh, is embedded, I think, in our practices. And it was one of the reasons why I think we have a poor relationship with the larger publics and find it very hard to imagine ways of engaging them authentically. So things are changing, however, and part of that change is happening in uh, thanks to the actual research management and administration in Canada. And I imagine this is happening everywhere, but uh, just in February, the Ministry of Industry actually announced an open access policy. If you're funded by the Tri-Council in Canada, which would be the three research councils, social science and humanities is one, natural sciences and engineering is the second, and health is the third. If you're funded by these, you're re you are expected now to make your research available in some sort of open access preprint form. That is a big change, and that indicates that there is a, that in some sense, I think the people who represent the publics have gotten, have lost patience with 
uh, with us and our ability to make our research genuinely accessible. If you look at the grants that we have in the social sciences and humanity, humanities, the major grant in, in Canada, at least, is actually called a partnership grant. And the second most important grant and this is actually a partnership development grant. The research agencies are using money to manipulate us, to try to sway us away from that Cartesian image and towards partnership. You cannot get the big money. And of course, you, you know, if you don't get big money, you don't get brownie points and faculty evaluations and annual evaluations and so on like that. Um, the Cool Institute, which I direct, is in fact, in many ways, building on this. We have a series of small grants that are designed to ladder people up. And the really big ones that go beyond uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the research agencies, the infrastructure grants, uh, definitely have to be done in large collaborative teams. So one of the things we're seeing is, actual, is we are being managed and manipulated to change our research practices. It's not happening fast. Uh, and it's partly not happening fast because I don't think we're actually talking about it. It's being sort of, it, we're, 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 the carrots are being dangled and the sticks are being brought out, but it hasn't become an issue within the humanities. You don't find philosophers talking that much about their actual research practices, except of course in the digital humanities. So that brings me to the other thing that I want to talk about and one that is more central to this, uh, to this conference, and that is citizen research or crowdsourcing. I call it citizen research because in the English speaking world, especially in North America, the word science has a number of associations that we have to be careful about. If I, if I call it citizen science to my colleagues, I will lose them immediately because science in many ways has, is the other. Um, this is not true, by the way, in French speaking Canada. In Quebec, it is fine to talk about les chances humaines, that is a, a much more inclusive term that includes the humanities and social sciences. And that's a sort of interesting cultural difference that we have in Canada. But in the English speaking world, there is, uh, there is an actual intellectual history to a certain aversion to quantitative methods in the humanities and some of the social sciences, uh, which I'm, I'm not going to go into. So for that reason, I'm going to call it citizen research, but you can all hear citizen science and science 2.0, just you know, make the mental swap yourselves. So what is, uh, uh, how, is citizen, uh, how is citizen research being deployed and how has it been deployed? Of course, one of the things that's interesting is that it's been around all along. The Oxford English Dictionary was an amazing citizen research project. Um, you know, it's probably one of the most important major uh, collaborative works of the late 19th and early 20th century. It was started uh, with a sort of paper in 1854. The public appeal went out in 1879. This was an appeal to the English speaking and English reading public to read books and make extracts for the Philological Society's New English Dictionary. Is, and you can find that document up on the web. And it's really quite interesting. They actually give a list of the books that they want people to read. And those of you who have read that lovely book, The Madman, The Professor and the Madman, know that all sorts of people rose to that, uh, to that challenge. Um, and here is one of the slips. It's sort of illegible here, but it's one of the slips that uh, Chester Minor submitted. Chester Minor was a Civil War doctor who in the sort of uh, moved to England after the Civil War and in the stress of uh, post-traumatic stress, he had a mental breakdown, ended up in an insane asylum, and from that insane asylum, he proceeded to contribute large numbers of quotations to the Oxford English Dictionary. So there is, there's something to be said for insanity in the humanities. Um, so that's but one of a number of projects, and I'm sure all of you if, you, if you think about it, and if you remove the computing from the equation, will realize that there have been projects like this, meteorological projects. There have been all sorts of examples of ways of engaging a broader public in the doing of research. Now, when we look at how computers have been used in citizen research, uh, one of the earliest projects is the suit online. And this is a fabulous example of a successful project. Uh, the Suda is a massive 10th century Byzantine Greek historical encyclopedia of the ancient Mediterranean world. It's basically a whole mess of small little uh, articles about different aspects of the Mediterranean world. It's the sort of document that no publisher would ever bother publishing. It's too big, it's too, 
disperse, and, and for that matter, no translator would want to spend their life chugging away through something that isn't going to be consulted by that many people. But it was, however, a perfect project for crowdsourcing. And in fact, the Suda Online project, the software is developed and running by 1998, so this is fairly early. Um, and uh, I think by 2002, 10,000 entries had been translated. And by October 2006, they reached the 20,000 mark. And by July of 2014, the last of 31,000 entries had been translated. They're still working on it because they have a pipeline where it's not just a matter of it being translated. There's also then editorial controls and, and various people checking the translations. But this is an example of a community coming together and doing a massive and probably ultimately uh, commercially impossible project together. And when you look at, when you look at the, uh, read the articles about this project, you find that many of the really successful, many of the major contributors were not academics. They were students. They were uh, Greek teachers in high schools. They were people who had done Greek and were now working in the stock market or something like that. It's a fabulous example of a project. Another one that you may have heard of is Transcribe Bentham. And I recommend uh, reading some of the articles that have come out of this if you're interested in, in uh, uh, citizen research because they've done a lot of work looking at the actual economics of how, the, of how this works. Jeremy Bentham, uh, the University of College London has some 31,767 manuscripts by Bentham. Bentham was one of these crazy polymaths who wrote all day as far as I can tell. You know, Bertrand Russell is another one who did it. Um, so they've got too much stuff and they're just trying to transcribe it. So if you get an account, you can see a page image and you can start typing away. You can put simple TEI markup. And uh, I think the last time I checked, 12,458 manuscripts of the 31,000 had been done. They've got about 39% of the way there. One of the interesting outcomes, though, of the research they've done into the economics of this is the amount of money spent on setting up the system and managing it is pretty close to probably what it would have cost to just you know, hire the graduate students to do it. You don't do this sort of citizen research. You don't build these systems simply to get the job done. You partly build them to engage a broader public. And that's one of the points I'm, I, I'm trying to make today. Uh, one of the most ambitious projects, which is really only just getting going, is uh, the Open Philology Project. That's the sort of umbrella term that has been launched by Greg Crane, who is the Alexander von Humboldt Chair of Digital Humanities at Leipzig. And uh, Digital Humanities, by the way, is the new name for humanities computing. I, I'm the old guard, and my program and, and, and projects were named back in, uh, before 2000. Anyway, he argues that in the humanities, we often don't let students do research, especially in classics. Nobody gets to do research, unlike in the sciences, where you know students are involved in labs in the summer and so on like that. In classics, you don't actually get to say anything to anyone until you're a graduate student. And even then, you're made to feel really insignificant until you're about 45. And that's when somebody finally pays attention and you make it on the bibliometric scores. He argues that this is not a good way to either get students to participate in our disciplines or to involve the larger uh, community. He argues for, and I quote here, a globally accessible library, laboratory environment designed to support students and interested citizens making immediate and attributable contributions to current philological research. And by that he means research into the shared ancient languages that we have, Greek, Latin, Arabic, Chinese. In fact, he goes further and argues is that this would contribute to a global dialogue of civilizations. That this is a way, because, and he points out that there's actually large numbers of students in Egypt studying Greek and Latin, far more than there are in North America now, because of the shared, uh, the shared history that we have. Um, he's imagined an environment that brings in, uh, it's really, you know, I've sort of boiled it down to this. You can find all sorts of papers he's written about it. There's collaboration at the editing environment that produces uh, fairly stable texts and media. Uh, the, the big data comes in. He's got a, a well-known paper on what to do with a million texts about automatic enrichment and linking named entity recognition. You, you hook those texts in with various dictionaries and morphological analyzers, grammar books, and so on like that. Then you make those available to students for learning in an open environment, and you um, 
and you allow them to participate. And you can see one of, this is an example of one of his environment. Here's an alignment tool where students can start aligning the English translation to, uh, to the Latin, which you can imagine has all sorts of useful, uh, can, can be used to sort of improve translation tools and so on and so on and so on. I'm now going to just zip through some of the other projects that I've been involved in. This is the Dictionary of Words in the Wild, which is a project uh, which you can upload pictures of the way words appear outside of textuality. And then you can tag them, and then you can look them up in the dictionary. You know, uh, It won't surprise you that the word open shows up in far more pictures than any other word, at least in English. And that's because lots of stores are open. And uh, this is a project that is taking hundreds of hours of Ukrainian folklore and allowing student, uh, students, Ukrainian, uh, we have a large Ukrainian community, to sign out passages, transcribe them, translate them. This is something we're just starting now, and what you're seeing is complete smoke and mirrors. This is for social networking. This uh, has an interesting, uh, well, I'm going to skip that. And I'm going to end by saying crowdsourcing. There are lots of, uh, I'm going to end by saying a few things about crowdsourcing and its advantages and disadvantages. Um, it only works when you can divide research tasks into atomic tasks and figure out how to motivate people. It's expensive to maintain. And it can be exploitative. I think the major use of crowdsourcing, to return to my original point, is really for establishing a new relationship with our publics. And on that, I'm going to thank you very much.